Welcome to the Technorama Tuesdays webinar series. My name is Hannah Murray and I'm the Student Services and Compliance Officer at the Community Media Training Organisation. I'm also a board member of Technorama and tonight we have a really exciting webinar for you. It's part of our two-part station security series. We are talking to the wonderful Ian McCowan from Seymour FM about uh, the station and what has just unfolded there. It's a uh, community radio whodunit. We also have John Mazels here, our wonderful El Capitan of Technorama, to talk about our upcoming AGM and uh, all the other Technorama goodness happening. Before we do that though, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are recording this webinar, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge that their sovereignty was never ceded. I'm going to throw over to John Mazels now to have a quick chat about Technorama and all things coming up. John, hello. Well, hello, hello, Hannah, and hello, everybody. Uh, this is the piece where you know we very quickly talk uh, while everybody who hasn't yet joined comes in, um, and. I'm hoping that half of Australia is tuning in tonight because the story we're about to hear is like completely, completely fascinating. And it shows the importance of being prepared. The reason it's worked out as well as it has for Seymour FM is because they were seriously well prepared. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, yes, I know. I know which one I'm going to show first. And it's not that one. Um, just give me one second here while I quickly throw up the piece of information that I want to throw up. Uh, there we go. So I should be able to now share the screen with you. So two things I want to tell you about, and I'll come back at the end of the show and uh, remind you about this. It's, you know, it's radio stuff. It's pre-announce and then back announce, back announce, back announce. So first thing is, I uh, want to let you all know that our annual general meeting is coming up. And the annual general meeting for Technorama is going to be held on Thursday night, the 24th of September. So it's a little over uh, four weeks away. Um, this uh, will be our fourth annual general meeting that we've entirely virtualized. So those of you who are now going through the experience of COVID and trying to work out how you run AGMs without everybody in the same place, uh, we've been doing this for three or four years because Technorama is, of course, a, a national organization. It is the only way we can meet. One of the things that's available to you as members of Technorama and participants in everything that we do is advice. And if we can help you with virtualizing your annual general meeting, not something to be afraid of, not terribly hard to do, simple rules that you need to observe as chair of a meeting, and then everything works just fine. So two things. One, this is our AGM, and uh, there are going to be a number of positions being elected, this year being an even year the president and the secretary are up for grabs um, and there will be two uh, board members although we had an exciting time and, and as you go through governance you discover all kinds of things about how your constitution works and what happens when people stand down and stand up and move into positions and everything else so uh, this year we're unbundling um, a president slash sorry a treasurer slash secretary role and that's going to cascade through some of the process. More about that later, don't need to cover that tonight. Um, but you should consider, um, if you're interested in getting involved, we'd love to have you involved. We want more people to be involved in actually helping to run Technorama. So that's coming up. Um, and there will be information appearing on the website probably tomorrow about how that will work. And, and we'll let you all know. Uh, the other thing that's going to come up, and uh, again, we'll back announce this um, a little later, is the um, second annual Stump the Chumps. So our next Technorama Tuesday is going to be a panel of experts who are just waiting to answer all those questions that you think are too hard for everybody and to see if you can challenge uh, the panel to come up with bizarre answers to bizarre questions, none of which will involve security uh, because, of course, we're going to cover all that tonight. Um, I wanted to share something with you just before I hand over and I'm hoping I'm going to be able to do this nicely. Let's see. There should be now a picture on your screen of a person um, looking at a console. Is that what you can see, Hannah? Yes. Yes. Who is this person? This person is one Ian McCown. 
Uh, this photo was taken in 1972. It's at the construction of the very first 3MU studio, which in fact was done for an open day. Um, the, the real 3MU at Monash University came uh, about four or five months later. Um, but this was Ian. Uh, and it's, you know, it's one of those photos. You never take enough photos of anything. You never take enough photos of anything. This was one of about 10 photos that we got and Ian was in it. So uh, there you go. That's what uh, that's what he looked like back then. So um, with enough of that, I am going to, let's see, stop sharing my screen so we can go back to Hannah. I'll join you at the end. Um, Hannah, over to you. Thanks, John. All right. So let's be honest. How ready are you for a fire, a theft, actions of disgruntled ex-volunteers, is your station's asset register up to date? Who has keys to your station and what might they do while you're not looking? We've talked about network ruggedness and now it's time to look at something even more fundamental. Would your station survive an unexpected physical action? And what can you do to both prevent and recover from that situation? In part two of tonight's station security series, we are taking a case study of Seymour FM's transmitter site. We're unpacking a breaking news case, um, Ian McCowan, of course, the wonderful face you see on screen. Seymour uh, FM will walk us through the recent attack on Seymour FM's transmitter site and discuss security measures stations should have in place for their sites. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah, for your kind words. Also to John for digging up a photo that I haven't seen for years. Um, interesting to note two things out of that photo. One, I had sideburns and two, I had hair. Uh, oh my, how things have changed. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's uh, all I've got to say on that matter. But look, thank you uh, for joining me tonight in this webinar. Uh, just to explain the way this is going to work, uh, I'll be going through a whole heap of PowerPoint slides, not to, to bore you to tears with death by PowerPoint and all of that sort of stuff. Um, you will find some interesting stuff in there. There's lots of photos, there's some videos, and I'll uh, show you those a little later, of course. And uh, you'll find it, uh, it quite interesting. But we are treating it as something that needs to, to wind back the clock a little bit, about seven years, going back to 2013, and uh, working from that point on, because a lot of the things that happened during the seven years, the last seven years, uh, are related to the final event, which is the uh, burning down, the arson attack on our transmission facility. So having said all of that, just bear with me for a moment and hopefully I'll uh, be able to show you the presentation. Okay, um, either Hannah or John, uh, we, you've got the, the slide there, I take it? Yes, thank you. Terrific. Okay, now um, just bear with me for a second while we get PowerPoint to play ball. Okay. Um, what we'll be talking about, the topics today, uh, first of all, the, the whole uh, presentation, uh, as I said, covers a timeline of seven years, uh, but it has relevance in terms of what in aviation is termed the Swiss cheese effect. So I'll talk just very briefly about that. Uh, also, it, it's our history that puts all of the conditions that made the fire what it was, uh, the mast and hut construction itself, adding an alarm system, the hut uh, video surveillance, and then the important part, a series of visitations that we had over a, uh, uh, a number of months. And then there's the final result, the raising itself. Now I mentioned uh, the aviation Swiss cheese effect. Uh, those of you who watch um, air crash investigations or any of the other programs of that ilk uh, will probably be familiar with this. Uh, essentially, it's a phenomena described in aviation as where there's a, a number of incidents uh, which are related to holes in, in slices of a piece of cheese. And if you fly through enough of the holes, a lot of individual relatively minor issues can then suddenly become something a lot more uh, substantial. And that in essence is really what we see in this presentation where there's lots of little things, but they do ultimately contribute to the final result. Uh, so this is uh, an analogy that we're just borrowing. The location itself is uh, 
outside Seymour, uh, heading towards Ye on the Goulburn Valley Highway, about two, three kilometres from town, so it's not uh, that far out of town. And it's uh, located, as you can see, in an area called Granite Park. Now, Granite Park itself uh, was a former military army facility up until the very early 1970s. It was then uh, relinquished by the army and handed over for uh, use as a racetrack, a motorcycle racetrack, and uh, over the decades that followed had various incarnations of that uh, same sort of activity, recreational activity. At the location where the yellow arrow is, you'll see a tiny little square. It's hard to make out. Um, I haven't zoomed in on it, but um, that's the transmitting hut that we're referring to. Now, surrounding this whole area, uh, you'll see two yellow lines there. Uh, the yellow line on the left-hand side is the Golden Valley Highway. Uh, the yellow line on the right-hand side is just a side road. And the two red lines represent faces. So the whole area is enclosed. Uh, by a cyclone fence and uh, some gates. So that gives you a little bit of an idea as to the uh, location, but that's important. The hut itself, and this is where um, the first, if you like, error was made. Um, the hut was essentially a, a, an ex-army hut that was on the site itself, uh, which was picked up and uh, relocated uh, onto stumps and everything else that's needed. Uh, this is uh, back in uh, 2013. You can see the first two segments of a mast that goes up 42 metres eventually. Uh, but that hut itself is, is an important aspect. And the reason why is because it's made of wood. Now, even though at that point in time the hut was empty, uh, we did have uh, a builder who is one of our current members. Uh, he's been around with the station for a number of years, uh, Greg Sharp. Uh, he's also a teacher at Broadford Tech, uh, Secondary College. And he and his students basically then fitted out the hut with uh, a dividing wall, a door, um, all of the uh, insulation and plaster and everything else. But it is, at the end of the day, something that can be uh, burnt and burnt very easily. Now it would be very easy to say well why don't we have concrete, a concrete heart or something made of metal, perhaps a, a cargo container or something. And the answer is simple. At that point in time we didn't have the funds. Uh, this was available. It was only literally just down the hill a, a short ways. So all we needed was a crane to pick it up and, and relocate it. So it made perfect sense in a financial uh, uh, per perspective. Another important thing to understand about this is that that hut and its facilities went for five years without any incidents whatsoever. But uh, we did want to add some security to the, to the hut, so an alarm system was installed in late 2015. Uh, there was a few problems with that alarm system. It was acquired through local channels. It wasn't really what you would call uh, a commercial grade system but at the end of the day, it did work. And uh, those of you who are familiar with JCAR would know that uh, they have a number of alarm systems uh, available, and this was certainly one of them. Uh, there was poor installation instructions. There are some things that don't change, unfortunately, uh, but we sorted all of that out and it was working. Now, the emphasis here is on the fact that it was 3G. 4G was around at the time, um, but, uh, I don't know the history of why a 3G system was, was chosen. Uh, I joined in, in the later part of 2015. Now, the other, ins uh, the other uh, thing that's interesting about the hub is that it was also a storage room or, uh, for a lot of our larger items. Uh, we have two uh, marquees that we use for outside broadcasting, one which is our uh, broadcast point and the other for merchandise. We have poles, tables, chairs, all of the usual paraphernalia that you would have. Merchandise in there and uh, not surprisingly there is a fair bit of technical equipment in that storage area as well. Speakers, stands, mixers and everything else to support that. And uh, I've made the comment on there eventually a fridge because uh, there's no water facility out there. That was for the techos. So, uh, but important to note, five years. Untouched, unvisited, nothing happened until February 2018. Now at this point uh, some corrugated iron was lifted uh, on the shed. Uh, you saw that it was uh, covered with uh, corrugated iron cladding. Uh, 
uh, and a hole was punched through the plaster on the inside and the insulation ripped out. Now, what we think happened is that the intruder themselves stuck their head through the hole. That would have set off the alarm system that was there, uh, which had two of those very, very loud alarms. They, they run at about 120 dB. And uh, that they were wearing sunnies at the time. Why on earth sunnies? We don't know. But uh, they fell off and we believe that they fled. Nothing actually happened. Uh, we don't have a picture of this one, unfortunately, uh, but it was the first of the, the incidents. There was also uh, a wire grill on a window above the, the cable entries, and we'll see a picture of that uh, shortly. Uh, we have a, a, our cables from the mast going in at ground level into the hut, which is something personally I don't like. I'd rather have it go in at roof level, but uh, that's what I inherited. And that's fine, but uh, we had in, uh, the intruders stand on a galvanized iron tray that supported uh, the Heliax cable and uh, uh, some of the other link dish cables and, and everything else. But importantly, the building was still not entered at that point. In September 2018 and ongoing, um, we discovered that lots of wheelies were um, being done by, I presume, four-wheel drives and, and that kind of vehicle in the uh, area surrounding the hut. Uh, if you think back to that picture I showed you at the beginning, it was a tiny little hut in this great big open uh, space area, and it was wonderful to go there um, for wheelies, according to some of the locals. Uh, so uh, we had a, a bit of a problem in that regard. Uh, I'll talk about the issues that that caused. Uh, one of them, however, which is most obvious, is that when you have 42 metres of mast, you also have guy wires supporting it um, in three different directions. And the, the fear is that if any of those vehicles collided with the the, the guy wires, then that would be enough to bring the tower down. Now, just a little bit of history here. The tower itself, which is 42 metres, uh, is originally 3XY's tower, where uh, Mr. Maisels had worked at, at one point in time. And, <coughs> oh, excuse me, the, uh, the mast itself was relocated uh, in its lifetime out to Sunshine and uh, used for another station and it was brought down by a tractor. There is actually a video on YouTube, uh, which you can have a look at. Uh, the guy was lucky to escape with his life. He, it missed him by only centimeters. Uh, so that risk was real. And we explained that to our council, which is the landlord. Needless to say that they were, the intruders were getting in somewhere into the grounds, um, either through gates or holes in fences or that sort of thing. So the first thing, what do you do about it? Uh, we had a, a proposal and costing to surround the hut and the mast with two and a half meter high cyclone fencing. Uh, that was considered, but when it costs in excess of $5,000, that's a difficult one to justify. We suggested to Mitchell Shire Council, who was the landlord for Granite Park, to go 50-50 on a surveillance camera. Uh, this one is, is for, uh, was part of our surveillance system, uh, which is made by Hikvision. You see them in airports around the world. They're well known. It's, it's high-grade commercial quality. Uh, it's not cheap, but by gosh, it's good and it's paid off in the long run. But that camera was $4,500, and the council said no. We looked at the option of replacing the 3G alarm system uh, and other monitoring options at this point. Uh, obviously needed upgrading to a 4G or, or better. Um, and that raised a, a number of issues. First of all, should we get a monitoring service like an ADT or something? Uh, the answer is yes, they could provide the service, but their response times, and bearing in mind that we're in a rural location, was terribly impractical. It could be one hour, two hours, three hours, and uh, in this particular instance, the building would have burnt down anyway, or the intruders left or anything else. So you have to ask the question, is it worthwhile? Since that time, we have identified a, a new player in town in Broad, uh, Broadford, which is 25 kilometers away, uh, and we spoke to them. However, their service area is everywhere from Lansfield, which is uh, 50 odd kilometers uh, to the west, to Mansfield, which is 50 odd kilometers to the east. And again, the service level time is just aren't practical. Uh, so the only option really for us is 
our own in-house uh, in alarm monitoring system using 4G with SMS messaging on it. But it does raise a very important point that you'll need to consider. And that is, well, if an alarm does go off and it's unexplained, should you go there? Should you put yourself at risk? or should you call the police or do something else? And again, there are reaction times from those other services uh, which come into play. So it's a very tricky one to work out. Eventually, uh, there's a picture of the hut uh, as it was uh, at the time of the arson attack. Uh, you can see the solar cells on the, the, the roof there. Um, the door, which is secured by two locks, that's a, a full security metal door uh, with two commercial grade security padlocks on it and there's a wooden door behind that with another two padlocks on it. Of interest there is the the windows that you can see on the front which are heavily boarded up. They do have a grill that you can't see uh, and there are a couple of other windows on the building. Now that's at that point in time. We had a, uh, a thought about surrounding the, the mast there, which you can see in the, the right hand side uh, with just a small little fence, a corner fence, if you like. Uh, you can see the cabling that's uh, on a tray just down the bottom there uh, going into the hut. And just to, to, to at least try and secure that particular area, but that didn't turn out to be very practical either. Uh, we then consider removing the windows completely and enclosing them with corrugated iron. And as you'll see later on, we, we proceeded to do that. Uh, we did consider additional lighting, but the question then was, are we helping them or providing something that just looked nice? Uh, so that was discontinued. And finally, all of that galvanized iron was secured by nails and uh, we decided to replace them with screws to make it more difficult for them to at least lift up as occurred earlier. Um, that was at that point in time, a work in progress. Moving on forward to the 7th of November, 2019, we had an attack where uh, the cabling, uh, there's two pictures there, if you look carefully, uh, into the hut was, was cut, uh, some light, light uh, link wires, tough cable as they're called, uh, from Ubiquity, they were cut, but also some heavy duty cabling on, on the mast itself, earth strapping and so on. Uh, and some of these cables are the 16 uh, millimeter square cables, so you can't cut them with wire cutters, you need to bring in something fairly hefty. So it's clear that this was premeditated. Uh, we didn't manage to get anything for, the, for this one. It was an event that was uh, pardon the expression, but a pain in the ass, and we spent time in, in fixing it. The heliax, as you can see, is actually that, that gray area of tubing um, going through a, a, a grommet in the wall. Uh, that's a one and five eighths heliac. That's one of the largest sizes you can get. So we come then to Mitchell Shire Council. Now Mitchell Shire Council is the landlord for Granite Park. They gave us the lease back in 2012. Uh, they're implicated because they have a duty of care in maintaining the facility itself. And that includes the fences and the gates. And quite frankly, they weren't doing it. Uh, they had attempts to fix a gate, and you'll see the pictures of this in a second, which were less than satisfactory. Uh, satisfactory and uh, you know, we had to push them quite hard in order to get that fixed. And it uh, was an endless succession of phone calls. So moving on, here's the gate in question. Now, this is uh, the way we found it when we did a check at one point. That gate is just sitting there, not even secured to the pole. There is a piece of wire wrapped around joining the two things together. Uh, so we bitterly complained and said, look, you need to you know, at least get the hinges on and all that sort of stuff. And uh, they ummed and ahed about it and then said, okay, all right, we'll do that. And they did. Similarly, there were areas of fences and this one's a little bit hard to see, uh, but the fence had been torn down and people climbing over it. So again, gaining access to the park. Um, I did mention before that it was a, a speedway in its formal life. Uh, so not surprisingly, you can see some tires there. There's about, um, it's estimated at between 20 and 50,000 tires on the site. It's an environmental nightmare. A lot of those tires are actually under mounds of dirt, uh, which were built for use by the motor carts and, and so on. And uh, on the right hand side there, you can see that the fence, uh, sorry, the gate was um, repaired, but they never locked the darn thing. And it turned out that even though you can see a chain on that fence and there was later a padlock, 
the, the chain itself couldn't fit around the pole. The pole is, was quite large. But did they tell anybody at the council? No, we had to do that for them and say, well, okay, you need to fix that up as well. Fix the chain up, do something, weld it close. I don't care, um, just fix it. So quite a difficult situation to deal with. Moving forward now to this year, and this is where it gets interesting. Between the 13th and 22nd of February, uh, now at this point we don't have external surveillance and because our visits to the, the location were fairly infrequent, we can't pinpoint exactly when this occurred. Uh, but somebody threw some concrete blocks up onto the roof, which needless to say, uh, had a disagreement with the solar panels that were there, so they were damaged. And then again, it, it happened uh, in the weeks that followed. Uh, there was a tripod thrown onto the roof and, and a few other things. Now, this was in effect fairly minor damage. I mean, these things are repairable, but it's also the damage that you know, teenagers do. Uh, and that was the thinking at the time. There was nothing else to go on. There, there were no other clues that could tell us uh, what that was about. Uh, so again, we had to go into uh, damage repair mode to some degree to fix that up. We then come to the 30th of March, and once again, you can see the, the door there. Um, the hut was broken into this time through a, a former window, uh, which had wooden covers on it, as I've explained before. Uh, the premises were entered, uh, were entered uh, physically by, by people and a mild attempt at gaining access to the storeroom was made. Nothing was taken. So all of this stuff is sitting there, marquees, mixers, speakers, the whole lot. They went in and they left. Whether this was a reconnaissance mission or not, we don't know. Uh, and you'll see some video footage in a few seconds. Uh, similarly, those uh, padlocks that I mentioned on the door earlier, they're commercial grade padlocks. We spoke to a number of locksmiths in the Seymour area who all said that even for them, picking them is very, very difficult. Uh, and that becomes relevant uh, to us a little later. Uh, but for this particular visit, they were cut with an angle grinder and uh, some of the, the locks were retrieved, others were not. But we had some good infrared pictures of the intruders. Here's some pictures of the damage that was done uh, where they came in through a hole. Uh, on the left hand side there, there's a window. Um, just to the uh, behind that picture, although you can't see it, is actually the equipment rack with the transmitter uh, and some heliax there to, to support it. So some of those panels fell under that, uh, but fortunately no damage. You can see the buckled tray where people stood on it. And uh, to the right there, there's an external view and a tripod, which we'd only just got down off the roof only days beforehand. So not good. Uh, again, there's remedies. We got to uh, board those windows up and put lots of uh, much thicker wood on the inside of the hut construction. Uh, all of the windows, or at least most of the windows were boarded up at this point with new galvanized iron. Again, in an effort to uh, resist the attacks. So here we get to the first of the videos. Now understand that these are infrared videos. There is no light as such in the location because the intruders are visiting over night time. Um, for this video, it will only run for about 30 seconds. We've got a range of videos, but I'm only show, uh, intending to show the salient ones. Um, but if you keep an eye out here, you'll see what happens. Just bear with me here while we go into play. Now, at this point, the hole has been knocked in the, through the wall. Our video cameras uh, or surveillance cameras do detect motion outside of the hut. So that's why these cameras are already in operation. Again, that's a feature that you don't get with domestic grade equipment. But you can see there's some torches, um, torchlight uh, being flashed around. And these are people who are behind that equipment rack with the transmitter. Uh, in the top left hand corner where the timestamp is, which we've since moved, um, you can see a head sticky up and some hands. Uh, unfortunately, he's wearing gloves, so there was no uh, fingerprints left, but that's our intruder there, uh, having a good look around, uh, not flashing any torches, but uh, having a look around to see what's going on. Now he will step down from that location and uh, he will come around and pay us a visit in a few seconds. Uh, again, you know, they're being a bit cautious, you know, what are they going to find uh, and so on. And here he comes. 
obviously, uh, a summery part of the year. He's only got shorts on. Um, he's got a hoodie on in the hope of disguising himself. He's a bit of a toughie. Decides that he can punch a door down, which opens in the other uh, in the inwards direction. So that's not going to work. Um, goes to the back again, has another look uh, and has a rethink and gets a bit tougher with a foot. Still not going to work unless he can dislodge an entire door frame. And so uh, that's our intruder. Um, at this point, for this particular um, intrusion, uh, we did not identify who that was, although that work is now being uh, looked at. But we did examine those frames very, very closely and we identified the top that he was wearing, what uh, design it was, uh, the shoes. We really went through that with a fine tooth comb and, and gave all of that information to police. After that, an hour and a half later, convinced that they couldn't get into the, the room through that particular door, they then came in from the outside. Now in this video uh, you can see the grinding of the, lo the, the locks taking place. Uh, there's cracks in the door, light shines through and so it becomes quite uh, obvious that they're uh, grinding that away. Okay, um, bear with me for a second here. Ah oh, yes, there we go. Uh, so they get the door open and believe it or not that's all they bother to do. There is a, in a later video, they do stick their head around the door for about five or 10 seconds. You don't see that in this one. And they didn't go in, didn't go in to have a look, didn't shine any torches, absolutely nothing. So as a result of these intrusions, more work was done. The first was to move all of the cabling from the bottom of the hut to the top of the hut. And you'll see that piece of, uh, in the right-hand picture, you'll see a piece of galvanized iron pipe where a lot of the thinner cables were redirected uh, into the, the hut. The uh, piece of heliax, a much more interesting task to relocate that one. So that wasn't done at that point in time and unfortunately wasn't done in time for the arson. Uh, the picture at the top middle uh, is where the um, cables come in through the wall and you can see some chrome blocks there. And that piece of galvanized iron, the bridging that you see in the two pictures there, that's actually the galvanized iron from outside, which we repurposed, we reflattened it and uh, mounted everything in. So we thought that was a pretty good job. At least that's uh, what we thought at the time. Similarly, we uh, came across some extra cameras. Now, these are the same cameras that were inside the hut. They're not really intended for outdoor use, but when you get them for next to nothing, when they're valued at several hundred dollars a piece, then something is better than nothing. So with that, uh, we mounted those up onto the tower and cabled those in through some conduit that you can see there. And uh, whilst they did give us some, some good images, uh, the location just was not suitable. Uh, so we then, only a week before the arson, had decided to quickly um, disconnect them and the intent was to move them uh, down into a better location and uh, that would have improved the infrared capability as well. But as with all things, uh, you we didn't know at the time what was about to happen and so uh, those cameras were unfortunately off at the time. And so we get to the exciting bit, or traumatic bit, put it uh, any way you want. Um, it's in some ways exciting to look at this, more likely from your perspective than mine, um, but the event itself occurred on Saturday the 4th of July, Celebration Day in the, the uh, U USA or Independence Day. And uh, technically it's two events that occurs, it's a break and enter and an, and an arson attack. A couple of important points to note in this is that the method of entry was not known at the time and it's still questionable. Uh, we are waiting for information from the police. Um, there are a couple of people, uh, as, as you, we'll talk about soon, um, who are um, not wanting to give information. The important thing is, uh, uh, is that there were no grinder sparks shown in any surveillance videos, unlike the previous entry. The door on the inside of the hut, which also had one of these commercial grade locks on it, uh, was not was removed, but not by a grinder. No sparks for that either. 
So uh, we're not exactly sure how that process occurred. We've suggested lock picking, which as I said before, was very difficult. Uh, and there is also uh, a thought about keys being used. Now I'll point out off the record at this point that Mitchell Shire Council had had also uh, some intrusions in some of their facilities. Uh, a truck was removed at, at one stage. And so the possibility that these people had keys, at least from our perspective, was very real and would help explain what happened. So here we are back in the, the hut. This is the night of the fire. You'll see two videos here. The first is this one where they come in. Um, just to explain the, the, the long ladder there, uh, that's a ladder that we had just acquired and we actually intended to store that elsewhere. But for the time being, uh, it was a very long ladder, as you can see, uh, it made its way into the, the hut storage room. Uh, at this point, the door has already been opened. There's not much to see in, in, the, in that happening. But from here on, you'll see the intruders come in. And as you can see, there's four of them in this particular instance. The hut door is there with the padlock. Uh, they're having a look. They're shining torches onto, onto that padlock and obviously not using a grinder. There's no way you could hide the sparks from that. And they are attempting to uh, open the lock and get in. So uh, not not good at all but eventually as we'll see in a few seconds they succeed uh, one of the intruders as you can see is jumping up and down it was quite cold that night uh, they're certainly rugged up all of which have got um, fairly heavy boots on that door is opened and we looked at some uh, free freeze frames of, of that door very very closely and discovered that the bolt assembly on the door was still intact so we know that they didn't remove the bolt assembly and that's true also of the uh, the front door the video stops at that point that is the last we see of them on that side of the hut and i'll explain why in the next video now in this video uh you'll see uh, the door that's on the right hand side of the frame uh the equipment rack is there as before uh the a little bit of the um, galvanized iron tray you can see uh, just behind the equipment rack there that was when all the cabling had been done and all of the work done to improve the security and so on so here's here's the door being flung open this is uh them coming through the door from the other side the bloke there with the torch who then goes around the back spots the alarm system which is mounted high on the wall we think that um, the alarm system had gone off and at this point in time the video stops just like before and the reason is that that whole equipment rack which has the transmitter the the sound processor the network switches uh, everything is powered off the one socket not uncommon and the guy uh essentially pulled the plug out of the, the the wall so everything at that point dropped now you might ask well how did we get the video at this point the video was relayed back through the stl link to the recording device in the studios and that's why we have the video if the recording device is at the site which uh is done in a lot of commercial setups uh station setups um you lose that as well so don't have the two things in the same place so that's all we get to see at this point um the aftermath of, of all of this the station itself went off air uh when that plug was pulled was 22 28 27 or 10 28 half past eight at night we did not have a, an off-air alerting system we'd never uh, put one in we had always thought about it but it's like everything there's a lot, long list of things to do apart from which when that uh, facility would go off air which was nine times out of ten due to a, a power outage we're lucky enough to have a backup transmitter and mast located at our studio facility in seymour so we'd just switch that on so it wasn't really a big deal not to have a an off air alerting system and so the priority was low um, interestingly enough, the broadcast content on air at the time was heavy me metal music. 
uh, not something that's liked by a whole range of people. And I'm guessing that the type of people who do listen to heavy metal are not the ones who are going to ring you up and tell you that your station is off air. So not surprisingly, we didn't know until the morning. Um, I received a call from Hank Kremers, who is uh, essentially my right hand man in terms of doing things, uh, not only technical, but uh, he's very good in a construction sense and uh, with tools and so on. Uh, he called me to tell us that we were off the air. That was at 8.19 a.m. Um, because of that, I did some checks from home. I can log into anything and everything. Uh, I can log into our transmitter, our links, um, all of that. But Granite Park was clearly not available. All of those facilities were not available or accessible. And that usually suggests a power outage. So with that, Hank was set to, sent to investigate. Uh, for him, that's just a three kilometre drive, so fairly quick. It takes probably more time to get through the gates at, at the park uh, and all the padlocks and paraphernalia than it does to do anything else. Anyway, uh, Hank got to uh, enter the site and I received a call from him uh, about the fire at 8. 38. So 19 minutes later, um, he was there. Uh, he didn't call immediately. He was somewhat traumatized. Uh, he'd been on, uh, uh, he'd been working uh, with Granite Park from the beginning, uh, back in 2013. So for him as someone who had dug trenches, uh, done cabling, um, did repairs to the walls, all of that stuff for him that was very traumatic and not surprisingly you know a fair bit of time would have elapsed before i received that call uh i told him to to call the police and everything which he did and uh it wasn't long before the victoria police was there the cfa uh, the criminal investigation units and the arson squad so it was a a quite populated place there for, for quite a, a long time and the police actually had to stay there overnight uh, pending arson squad investigations as well. So here's what it looked like. This is the picture that um, Hank uh, first was confronted with in the morning and uh, you'll see a few of these. This is looking west towards um, Tellerock Ranges. This one is looking, uh, oh sorry, uh, West, yes, sorry, Talbot Ranges for South. This is looking west. You can see the frame at the top, which was the solar cells, uh, solar panels. Uh, you can see a rack in there somewhere uh, burnt out. That's the one that uh, had all the gear in it. And there was actually a second rack, which you can make out just behind it, uh, which was not used, but it was there nonetheless. So there the pictures are uh, fairly grim fairly de devastating for everybody who got to see that and that final one there is is the switch gear and so on that was at the top of the rack an interesting point here all of the gear that was in the rack uh, is secured with uh, the normal bolts that you have um, cage cage screws and the uh, transmitter the digital signal processor and one either one other item of equipment um, were all removed the clue for that was the fact that the screws weren't there. Um, down below there, there was some some uh, old UGFM transmitters that we still had. They were were sort of there in, in a couple of pieces, but the cage the, the cage screws were still there. But for the expensive bits, no cage screws. So we have every reason to believe that the uh, gear had been taken. How are we going for time? Good. Um, so it comes to the perpetrators. Uh, as we had done previously, once again, we set about getting videos um, ready for the police, uh, frozen or still images from the videos. We did a lot of, if you like, detective work of our own. Uh, not so much because we wanted to do that, uh, but because it was better to, to have done it and known that it had been done uh, and to assist police and they were certainly grateful for that work as well. Uh, bear in mind that at this point in time COVID-19 was, was occurring and police were, were, as they still are, pretty much flat chat. So anything and everything that we could do, we did. We uh, have to use the word alleged, not surprisingly. It was committed by four offenders, four because that's how many you see in the video. We have reason to believe that there were another two people who were outside the hut. On Wednesday, the 15th of July, so uh, not a long time after, 11 days passed, 
detectives arrested a 30-year-old Seymour man. So that was the first of the good news. Uh, he's been interviewed and charged with burglary, theft, criminal damage, meaning arson, trespass or trespass and going equipped to steal and possess ammunition without a license. And we saw that and thought, huh, what? <laughs> What's that got to do with it? Well, it turns out that these people had not intended to go to our facility originally. They actually went uh, to a bike track, a BMX track, which is sited north of Granite Park, only a short distance away, half a kilometre. And we understand that they saw our facility and that perked their interest and then came our way. So we were in effect, not the primary target. We were the secondary target. Uh, and uh, that site, um, why, why they would have ammunition, we don't know, but uh, nonetheless, that charge is there. The person himself was bailed to appear uh, at a Seymour Magistrates Court on the 8th of October. Um, I will definitely be there, as will a number of other people. Uh, two other men and a teenage boy have also been arrested earlier in the week as part of the ongoing investigation. Uh, and their ages, as you can see, were 17, 23 and 25. They've been released, uh, but the, the ringleader, if you like, is playing hardball in terms of um, admitting to information. Not surprisingly, we do have information uh, which I'm not able to, to reveal to you tonight. Uh, that's uh, by agreement with the police. As I said before, we did uh, take stills from the video images and we did some enhancement work, all of that sort of stuff. And this pretty little picture uh, turned up, uh, which is the, the best of the, the face images, but enough to give us a, a bit of a clue as to who it might be. And as you can see there, we mentioned that a key enlarged still picture that contributed to the identification of this person was also provided to the police. And that picture is this one. It's the same person, but more importantly, what you can see on his hand. That marking on his hand is a tattoo of a rose. We made that public. And lo and behold, we were swamped in calls of pe by people who believed they know who it was. And pretty much across the board, that same name, which I can't reveal, kept popping up over and over and over again. We enhanced, enhanced that image to make the tattoo uh, much more obvious. So that was the linchpin of it. Meanwhile, on Facebook, uh, there were a lot of devotees and some of you might even be uh, listening to this presentation tonight, but uh, they dominated a particular discussion thread and emphasised that the likely offenders were former members of the station that may have been harbouring grudges, disenchantment, or perhaps something else. They may not have liked us for whatever reason. Well, guess what? Those people were wrong. These people, the offenders, were not in any way or ever have been associated with Seymour FM. And that brings a, a very important point that I want to make. If your station has former members that do have some sort of bad attitude towards you, um, largely that's a failure on your part, or at least your management team's part, to properly address that situation. Uh, you need to get to a point where you can agree to disagree with those people and have an amicable separation. More often than not, in circumstances where I've been involved in other stations where that sort of problem exists, it's more often, uh, more often that I find that uh, the proper procedures for grievance have not been followed. That's very important to a person who harbours a grudge against you. Uh, you need to follow the grievance policy because that gives them the confidence and uh, determination to see it through and to find that amicable separation. A very important point, but quite sadly, there are a lot of stations who do not make that process available. And that is also not legal. Almost finished. One of the other things that you need to consider is your plant and equipment list. It surprises me that a lot of stations still do not have these things. You have lots of toys to play with, and yet you still don't have a plant and equipment list. You need to have it. It is technically a requirement 
um, in an audit process for your accounting. Uh, you should have a depreciation schedule for that for your end of year balance sheet so that you can get the true value of what your station is worth. Um, and that list needs to include your manufacturer uh, of the device, the model, um, a name if it has a name, serial number, uh, where you got it from ideally in case you have to replace it. Uh, and, and that's the, the, the thing that we're having to do at the moment where it's located in your facilities. So you may have multiple facilities, so you need to track that um, and its monetary value. The bottom line of all of this is that have, uh, should the need arise to put in, a sh uh, put in an insurance claim like we've had to do, then that, uh, that becomes vitally important. And once again, off the record, we've had to do that. The total value of the damage at Granite Park with our transmission facility is just a whisker over $90,000. That's the value of hut, the equipment, the, the marquees, everything. And that uh, was a, a lengthy Excel spreadsheet that we constructed. We, we left almost nothing off of that list. So that brings us to the end. Um, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from that. Um, you know, going through it, you know, the choice of, of the type of facility you have, whether it's wood, metal, concrete, or whatever, um, what you do along the way in terms of securing the site, is it enough? Do you respond fast enough? Uh, we certainly have learned our lessons. We've done things. Sadly though, for us, we just didn't do enough and in time. However, Having said that, at the end of the day, it still is a wooden hut. So it still doesn't take much to send up in smoke. So some thank yous, uh, first of all, to Hank Kremers. Uh, he was the one, as I mentioned before, who was confronted by uh, the raising or the, the fire or what was left of the hut um, and being traumatized for some time and uh, putting in the Victoria Police call. There was a huge outpouring of community and business support as seen on our Facebook and many other pages. We reached as part of that uh, process, almost 17,000 people. Now that's as of yesterday, 5,000 engagements. That's 30% of those people actually chose to comment, click a like button or an angry button or do something. That is extraordinarily high and uh, the post itself was also shared 125 times uh, one in, of which was a surf life uh, surf life saving club have no idea how that worked but it was the outpouring of uh, community support though was staggering i can tell you that those uh, people uh, who have been identified there is a very very long queue of people who would like to uh, impart their own form of justice which of course we don't recommend um, Victoria Police, Seymour CIU uh, for their handling and diligence uh, in hand, handling this whole exercise. Um, out of interest, the, the officer who was charged with um, following this up, the arson attack, uh, was actually new in the job. It was their first time and the first thing they were told was that they had Buckley's hope of solving an arson attack. So they were obviously quite chuffed. I can't reveal who that is though. Um, Seymour Telegraph and ABC Goldman Murray uh, for their support and the interviews that we did. We also did uh, Channel 9 um, in various guises and Wind TV. Uh, 1FM in particular for suggesting a fundraising campaign and a special joint broadcast, which we did recently. Uh, and that so far has raised over $23,120. That's uh, as of uh, a couple of days ago to the commercial and community radio stations for their offers of assistance and equipment to keep us on air. And fortunately, we've had to do very little of that. There's only a couple of things that we've, we've borrowed, not to actually get us on air funnily enough, but to make us sound good. Uh, one of which was a, a digital sound processor, but uh, thanks nonetheless to those people. And finally, to Seymour FM volunteers who worked so hard to build, maintain uh, and improve the facilities of the hut over many years and many, many hours. So that's the story. And uh, that brings us to the conclusion. And I think I've made it just in time. So uh, thank you to all of those. It's a long story, but there is so much that can be learned out of that. Um, everybody's situation is a little different, but have a think about your choices as you go along and the future, what you need to do 
to make those choices work for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. It's astounding to see the amount of work you had done to future-proof the station and, you know, even with such great facilities and great security systems, it was still possible to, you know, get in and do some serious damage. And I think um, this whole station security series has been focused on, you know, how can we actually get ourselves to a point where we have our asset, asset registers all sorted, we're completely compliant, we have good governance, like you said, um, to know what our um, volunteers are doing, you know, if there's disgruntled people, you know, there's so many things to consider with station security. It's not just your physical security, it's, it's intellectual property, it's everything. That's right, that's right. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, I'd encourage you to either pop your hand up in the chat and uh, we can, you can use your voice to ask a question, or if you would like to use the Q&A function, please pop a question in there and um, we will answer it. But uh, while we're waiting for questions, uh, John. Well, Ian, it's some, something that really does come out of this, everybody thinks about doing this stuff when it's too late. And you know, you've said you didn't do everything that you had wanted to do. And there was some, some missteps along the way. Who knew that you would take down the, the cameras just before they were really needed? You, you never know these things. But what has been the post-incident reaction? What is it now that you would do that was completely different? Or what would you add? What, what is the most important thing? And what about the people around you? What has been the reaction around you to, ah, we all need to be more prepared. Well, addressing the first question, <clears throat> what, would we, what would we do differently? Um, the answer to that is really at the very beginning, which is the choice of building. That really is the, the thing that contributed most towards the fire. Um, it was made of wood. It was, uh, mm. you know, it, it was a, a building in waiting, so to speak. Um, from the, the uh, the reports that we had from the CFA uh, and our own observation that the fire was actually lit inside the hut. Now, sadly, because it's a storage hut and we put a lot of things out there, uh, there were you know, a box full of rags for, for cleaning things. You know, there was lots of material which were, were excellent. Lots of flammable fuel. stuff. Yeah, it was all yeah. fuel for a fire. It was just yeah. a, um, you know, a, a situation in waiting. And that's why I make the comment at the very end, you know, even though we had done all of those things and putting cameras in, uh, all you need is a little bonfire under the bottom of the hut and it's gone anyway. Mm. So that's the reality of it. And that's where we now focus our attention in making a choice for a new building uh, where we won't totally eliminate the possibilities of damage but we'll greatly resist them. Um, and that might mean mm. concrete, it might mean um, steel lined huts or containers. Uh, we, we're not exactly sure, we're going through that work at the moment. Um, in terms of uh, supporters of the station and the general community itself, uh, as I said, they, they were ropeable. There is uh, a long line of a lot of people who had stuck their ha uh, hand up and, and actually voiced it on Facebook. As fast as people were doing it, we were mm. having to remove the post. Um, you know, who said, you know, we want to know who it is. We want to, you know, <laughs> impart our own justice. Mm. Uh, and that's very satisfying on one hand, but very dangerous on the other. Uh, our volunteers, of course, they, they're affected by this um, uh, but they're, they're in a funny situation when this happened because of COVID-19 happening. Uh, a lot of them are already not attending the studio and not either doing shows from home or just not on air. Uh, so that's been a, a very strange thing to work through uh, in terms of seeing how that uh, affects people. Mm. Uh, but for the most part, everybody uh, is very positive about what we're doing. Um, COVID-19 has certainly had an impact. And I might also mention uh, and this is what makes it very hard for us this year. We're also meant to be relocating. It was meant to happen at the beginning of the year. COVID-19 came up. Um, and so our work with council, getting permits and plans and everything else, that all got delayed as well. So we are now very, very much under the pump, but we're charged up um, mostly because of the, the efforts of everybody else in, in, in uh, 
uh, giving, this in, giving us the encouragement and so on. Um, we still have shops in town who want our donation boxes. We've run out of those. Uh, and so it's going on. So that spirit is very definitely there to, to get us back to where we were. Uh, just to explain, we're on a temporary transmitter that we have located at the studio with a mast. Uh, we get 200 watts out, out of that. Um, our normal facility is at 500 watts. Uh, so there's a big change in, in the reception area as well. And so we, we've had calls from outlying areas that are saying, hey, where's, where are you? Uh, mm. What's going on? And it wasn't really until the newspapers um, hit it uh, in the following days that everybody then knew what had happened. So uh, quite a big impact and it, it was spread uh, in terms of uh, news and information way beyond what we ever thought likely. Mm. Has, has there been a, a positive reaction from the people who support you? So the people who said, oh, we don't really need to worry about the gate. We don't need to really worry about cameras. Have they sort of visibly changed their approach and, and said, yeah, we should be smarter? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, fairly much across the board with the exception of one player. Mm. And, and um, uh, I would suggest to you that would be our landlord, Mitchell Shire itself. Uh, I, I'm quite happy to, to put them in the dirt at the moment because <laughs> a, 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 lot of the, a lot of the way through, you know, we're having to, to continually pound them and say, look, you know, fix the fence, fix the gate. Mm. You know, mm. having people dropping wheelies and things in, in the area surrounding your hut, that in itself wasn't too bad. But when it's in proximity to those guy wires and, you know, 42 tonnes of tower, that's not a good start. Um, so that puts them at risk. And we started to get rather heavy with them and we're talking about duty of care and, and implications insurance wise and all the rest of it. And it was only then having to go to that extreme that they begin to or began to realize that they had to do something. Yeah, I'm guessing though you, you need to be a little bit careful with your landlord because if you if you hammer that direction too much, um, a very, very weighty tower with guy wires, et cetera, et cetera, um, that you could, you could have your landlord turn around and go, well, maybe we don't want you there at all. Yes. Uh, and that was a consideration uh, for two reasons, uh, not only for the, the reason that you've just given, uh, but it's also our landlord who has given us our new premises into which we want to relocate. Mm -hmm. So it was very much a catch 22 situation. Uh, and, and it was a case of just getting that message across forcefully enough not to rock the boat, but at the same time to get a result. Mm. Uh, and that, that proved a, a little difficult. And to date, we still haven't moved, moved into our premises, but that's really due to, to lots of other things. So. so what will you be doing at the new premises in terms of cameras, security and so on, having gone through this experience at the transmitter hut site? Uh, at this point in time, we are giving or oh, we're running a project which is looking at whether we should rebuild at the granite park site um, or move elsewhere um, there are some advantages in moving one of which is caused by uh, mitchell shire itself they have a project uh, which was launched last year to actually revegetate and re-establish Granite Park and remove the 20, 50 odd thousand tires that are out there um, and to make it a public facility. Mm. Um, so it makes sense for us to say, well, if you can assist us, then we might be able to relinquish that site. Yeah. That allows you to get on with it. And that, that, that's a win-win situation. That would be my ideal situation. Uh, I think in the short term, what's likely is that we'll put something temporary out there so we can get back to full power. And mm. while that's in place, we'll build a new facility elsewhere. Uh, we've located two prime locations, which are, are nice and high and give us all that we need. Uh, topographically, they are certainly better from a transmission point of view. And uh, as I said, that work is in progress. But of course, then you've got ACMA licensing involved sites and, and all of that to, mm. to uh, consider as well but uh, that work is in prog pro progress at the moment. Mm. Now we did have uh, John Hoskin put his hand up to ask a question. Uh, John if you're still listening um, did you want to put your hand up again? <laughs> I'm sorry I missed it the first time. If not that's fine. Um, I have attached for everyone uh, the link to the Seymour FM transmitter fundraiser. Uh, so that if, if you can give to that, that'd be great. If you can share it amongst your community radio networks, that'd be awesome. Ah, 
Good thank, thank you for doing that, but I didn't realise you had the link, so uh, thank you. No, that's okay, my pleasure. Uh, put your hand back up and I will let you talk, mysterious person in the well, participants list. John who says he's on the wrong computer. Oh, okay, John. <laughs> oh, wait, it's fine. Um, so yes, uh, we do have uh, that link in the chat for everyone to uh, use mm -hmm. and share, and I think um, the community I think what I found really heartening about this situation is the community radio um, family, if you want, have really mobilised behind Seymour FM and um, yeah, what has been the reaction amongst community radios aside from Seymour? Like, have you had a lot of people reach out? And not a not a lot of people. I think it's it's more a case that they were. Uh, shocked by by what had transpired uh, and of course that uh, had implications in their their own realms mm. um, we haven't really had people asking questions about well how can we fix this or how can we fix that uh, i think people have, have got the capacity in their their own right to uh, work through these situations and uh, this has been more food for thought than, than anything else, I think. Uh, it's also worth noting that there were some commercial broadcasters who we also heard from, um, who also have been uh, reassessing their, their own situations. So it's not only community radio, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is the commercial world as, as well. Uh, maybe in a different way, uh, the circumstances will be a little different, uh, but for us, I guess the, the clincher to all of it uh, and in what you do is the fact that we are a rural station, um, and a lot of the facilities or money and things that, that that would apply in the big city just does not work or apply in a rural environment and, and alarm monitoring is clearly one of them um, mm. it would be lovely to have that but it, it's just impractical it just doesn't work but certainly one of the one of the great thoughts is uh you know being able to telemeter um information back to the station on the reverse side of a digital link just being being able to um make use of opportunistic um functions that already exist there and be a bit creative and something is better than nothing yes absolutely and uh that's that you know you have all of this link capacity there a lot of people use um um audio over IP uh, for their links and so on. Um, often they're running at, at 100 or 200 megabits per second mm. and you're just ch chuffing down 200 kilobits a second's worth of audio. So you've got this, this huge amount of bandwidth there just sitting there idle. Mm. So the challenge is to find ways of using it. So we were actually um, got to a point where not only did we have six video cameras running back, uh, which did create a little bit of a quality of service problem uh, for those of you who know about IP and quality of service uh, that became a little bit of a challenge uh, but uh, we also had a return audio feed coming back and a few other little odds and ends as well um, mm. to make it all work. Mm. Um, we've had a few comments Stephen Wilkinson has said thanks to Ian for your detailed presentation yes and Tim Gardner has said would consider changing the location of the transmitter site could you have the studio at the same site? Uh, given the sites that we're looking at, the answer is no, uh, because we are trying, uh, mainly due to the, the topography of the area, uh, mm. we are trying to uh, keep ourselves at, at the high locations, basically. Um, and all of those locations are essentially out of town, uh, which means where we are uh, is, is, is better than, than those sorts of places where access would be difficult and everything else uh, so we will stay in town uh, and as I said we are locating only a, a kilometre and a half away from our present location into something that's a lot bigger and we'll get to have a second studio and a lot of other things that we've been wanting for some time so mm. uh, an awful lot of work ahead of us not only in building that transmitting facility uh, but also in uh, building new studios as well. Fabulous. Mm. John Hoskins looks like he's uh, got his hand up, which means that he's got his computer running, ready to go. So I'm going to allow him to talk. Um, you'll have to unmute your microphone on your end, John. There we go. How are you? Hello. How are you, John? I'm on, I'm on my iPad now. So yeah, oh, th thanks for that, Ian. Like, that was really disturbing, you know, what's going on. And, I've, and my, my heart really goes out to you, you know, like to the station and everything. But um years ago like in with sporting uh, uh, groups that i've been involved with i remember 
about 15 years ago, we had a situation that, uh, that some people broke into our, into our club and um, stole a lot of equipment. There was no fire or anything, but again, it was a similar situation where the council weren't putting chains on fences and all that sort of stuff. So what we did in the end, we put our own chain and, and padlock on there and, and then gave the council a key so that they could get in. And that worked. And then we started working with council, like fixing fences ourselves. And we actually paid and got a contractor to come in and actually mend a fence and all that sort of stuff. And then at the end of the day, and let the, and bang the drum and let the council know, hey, guys, I've done this for you. Don't say because you haven't done it. I've done it for you. And then when it comes around to, uh, for help from then, they, they say, well, oh, you'll let these people you know help out and whatnot so we'll give them money you know and and I, and and we've experienced that on and on and on now the councils are sort of like our best friend <laughs> yes there are clearly councils uh that work better than others uh in that regard um i'm not saying that mitchell shire council are not cooperative with us they certainly are and they're, they're helping us with the relocation um but i guess it comes down to if you like individual departments or personalities uh potentially you know how, how far you can can get things done uh, uh, can be challenging at times uh, and you mentioned before about repairing the fence uh, bear in mind that Granite Park has about four kilometers of fencing uh, so when you suddenly talk about that sort of, of, of uh, exercise um, that's just beyond beyond our capabilities we, we just couldn't support that yeah. Mm. yeah but yeah I know it's hard but it's it's yep. really when you're working with um, local government because local government now is the is the manager of crown lands and it's really when whether you're a radio station or a sporting body or whatever it's really all about communication and partnerships yeah mm. absolutely I, I don't disagree with that uh when it comes back to um putting a fence around the immediate vicinity of the hut and our transmitting mask uh, as i said the cost was in excess of five thousand dollars but the other grim reality was that it takes no time at all to, to cut a hole in the fence anyway um, yeah. and and you're really only slowing things down rather than stopping them uh, we even considered putting razor wire on the top uh, but that then comes with a whole heap of legal implications again that comes back to duty of care uh, if you do have uh, an intruder who climbs over a fence and you've got razor wires sitting on the top and that person does themselves an injury, guess what? You get um, uh, fined or not so much fine, but you are liable for their injuries. So, you know, you, when you look at it in, in close detail, um, it then becomes a little bit more pro problematic. Well, I, I, I can remember years ago, uh, when uh, driving through Italy, there was a look like a community radio station transmitter tower, and they had a big fence around there, and they had two German shepherds running around inside. Of it. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> but again, duty of care, even with German shepherds, does come into play. <laughs> it's wrong country, yeah. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to find two German shepherds for every transmitter. Mm. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> And, and I, um, I can see that this is going to be a topic for future Technoramas. I think it's, a, it's an area where we need to spend more time because it is so important to get right and relatively easy to get right and relatively bad if you get it wrong and the circumstances come up like your Swiss cheese example. Yeah. Mm. Um, there, there, there are just so many things that, that can be learnt, uh, mm. you know, be it the cameras, how you deploy the cameras, where do you deploy the cameras? Um, mm. You may, may have noticed the distortion on those cameras, the, the, the visual aspect of them. That's because they're not full fisheye cameras, but they're, they're partial fisheye cameras, fisheye lenses, um, and we get a sweep on those of 99 degrees. So what that means is that if you put them into the corner of a building, you see, you see everything, everything that goes mm. on, um, mm. except for the immediate area underneath the camera. Uh, but on the basis that something is going to be going towards the camera, then that's uh, not necessarily a problem as such, unless somebody comes in underneath it, I suppose. But you, you were talking about cameras that were worth a couple of hundred dollars, and the total bill for this is like 90000 Yes. Yes. Um, at, at some point, you've got to look at the return on investment. And yes, the technology might be expensive, but 
is it more expensive to not have the technology? And I think what you've demonstrated is that there's a very strong case to be made for putting focus on this. And I can say that in the time that I've been assessing grant application for the CBF, I can't recall off the top of my head ever seeing anybody say we want a grant to uh, to put in a security system um, now we've got a, a a really good test case we've got a yes. really good case study that says here is the potential here's the return on investment and you know it, if it, it's a good thing to protect the investment that you've already made in the rest yep. of your infrastructure yeah. the, the bottom line is that you have to find the money somehow mm -hmm. uh, whether it be through cbf grants council grants government grants whatever um, do everything you can uh, to get the money that you need to buy the, the appropriate equipment, um, avoid domestic gear. Uh, mm. That has certainly paid off for us in everything except the alarm system. Uh, but that was just prior to my time at Seymour FM. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, do everything you can uh, to, to get it. Uh, it does take time, uh, even when you look at the timeline when the problems first began. Uh, uh, even grants become a little tricky because you can only get so much every so often. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, even the timeliness aspect, excuse mm -hmm. me, uh, becomes a, a little difficult. Yeah. We have one more question uh, from Heidi and then we'll wrap up for the evening. Um, Heidi's asked, even if an audio alarm doesn't get perpetrators caught, it might frighten some away. Would it be worth it? Uh, the answer is yes, because we know from one of the earlier break-ins that um, somebody who, who lifted that corrugated iron and punched a hole in the wall, they clearly fled. There was no doubt because they didn't come in through the building. But you're um, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, we're, we're... That's right. We, we're in the middle of nowhere. And um, there, there's nothing much you can do to, to prevent that sort of, you know, putting steel plating mm. on, on mm. the thing. Uh, but the, 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 the sirens that we had are very very loud uh if you if you have them running and you're in their proximity for any longer than about a minute two minutes then you will have hearing damage so not not a matter of attracting somebody uh, attracting the attention of somebody else but maybe no. just making it very very uncomfortable yeah. for the person who's there that's exactly yeah. right it, it made it scary uncomfortable and everything else uh because there is no one uh, there's no facility or, or building uh, or residential ten, uh, residential property yeah, yeah. Uh, within at least a kilometre of that location. So, um, you know, short of setting off flares or something, no one's going to know. Yeah, true, uh, true. Many so transmitter huts, of course. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, there you have it. Thank you so much, Ian. It has been so educational and so valuable to have you talk about Seymour Offence Transmitter site and giving us all your tips and tricks to um, kind of yeah. proof our stations as well. Um, as I said to everyone, we have put the link to the fundraiser for Seymour Offence Transmitter site rebuild. So if you could share that around, if you could even donate, that'd be fabulous. Get them back, back on solid ground, so to speak. Um, John, would you like to say some more Technorama things before we finish? Sure. So let's just uh, let's just pick up and don't go away because you remember that photo at the start. I've um, uh -oh. oh yes, so I'm going to take us back to that. So um, the reminder that oop, there we go. Annual general meeting coming up. So it's put the date in your diary right now, 24th September. It'll be at seven o'clock Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it's a chance to review what it is that Technorama has been doing. Um, if you remember, you know, you're invested to the tune of $10. It's amazingly cost effective membership. Uh, and uh, if you feel like it, you could be standing for committee or for one of the other positions. On September the 29th, our next Technorama Tuesday will be Stump the Chumps. So this is where the, the improbable specialists get to take your questions live without a safety net. We're going to encourage you to come up with the strangest, weirdest questions that you could throw into the mix. And uh, let's see if you can actually challenge challenge the the chumps into a corner and really stump them. So there you go. And finally, I look, I said the, the picture. So there you go. This was the very first incarnation of 3MU. It was in very early days for community radio. Um, 
Ian and I met at Caulfield Tech, which had already been going for, I think, about a year at this point. We put this station together with uh, gear that we had borrowed for an open day to prove that it could be done and ran programming for the holiday. All the gear was borrowed, and here's what I noticed. So, QMaster cartridge machines, an AWA console that was the type being used by a very large number of radio stations in those days, consolidated electronics turntables, and the Sennheiser headphones. Or, and the other thing in there, um, uh, an Ian McCown. Now, four out of those five devices were designed and made in Australia. One of them wasn't. Yes, the headphones were made in Germany. Uh, they were probably the most popular headphones at the time. Um, everything else was popular for different reasons. But I thought it was really interesting. At this time, we were able to put together a radio studio almost completely with equipment designed and built in Australia. And you can't do that anymore. It's a bit sad, isn't it? So there you go. Just something that I, I noticed there. Um, Ian, it's been uh, been really great to know you all this time. Thank you very much. And it, just, and it just shows you, you never know where life is going to take you. Indeed you don't. Um, I would never have thought six years ago that I'd be at Seymour FM, but uh, as they say, there you go. Here we are. Mm. So all good fun. Thank you anyway. so much, everyone. Um, it's been great, like I said, to have you, Ian McCowan. So great. Uh, thank you to our El Capitan, John Mazels, for um, <laughs> coming in and talking about Technorama. And um, if you uh, missed any of this uh, episode of Technorama Tuesdays, or you are interested in watching part one of the series, uh, that is on our YouTube channel. You can find it on YouTube, just search Technorama Tuesdays, and it will pop up. So I'd recommend Watch the part one if you didn't get to watch it before this webinar. And um, thank you so much again for sharing. And thank you all for coming tonight. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Um, not next Tuesday. <sighs> next month on the last Tuesday of the month. <laughs> Stop the chumps. Uh, but for, for now, good evening. Have a good one. See ya.